You've got three days to do everything you want to do in Disney World. So get ready to ride the top tier rides, see the best shows, and eat the tastiest snacks in our jam-packed three days in Disney World. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. Now, if you're getting ready to go on a three-day Disney World extravaganza, or at the very least you're thinking about doing that, then today's video is gonna be perfect for you. The DFB team and I have put our heads together to create that detailed three days in Disney World that'll help you make the most out of your limited time in the parks. This means getting on the most rides, skipping the thickest of lines, multitasking to accomplish more stuff, and expanding your days to be as long and Disney-fied as possible. Now, a little disclaimer before we begin, Again, a lot of this three days in Disney World is going to be jam-packed with advice for people who are ready to go, go, go. But we'll also try to slip in some tips for those who want to slow things down a little bit and really savor the time they've got in the parks. Just remember that at the end of the day, this is your vacation. So take our suggestions with a grain of salt and make sure you're conquering the parks at a speed that works best for you and your family. All right, day zero. Before you dive headfirst into the parks, let's do a bit of pre-planning. That way you can first maximize your trip while you're there, and second, you don't have to do any extra planning during your trip. First, you're gonna wanna decide your plan of attack. If you wanna visit all four parks with just three days to spare, then you might wanna consider adding park hoppers to your purchase. Just keep in mind that if you do purchase park hoppers, that's gonna be applied to every day of your visit, whether you use them or not. So you're gonna have to pay extra for those park hoppers privileges all three days of your trip. For this specific itinerary, however, I'll be using a different strategy to visit all four parks within the span of three days without purchasing park hoppers. Don't worry, I won't keep you in suspense too long. I'll explain my strategy once we get to day two. Now, once you know what parks you're going to visit on which days, make sure you've got your must-dos all listed out. We're going to give you example must-dos throughout today's video, but your priority experiences may very well deviate from what we're about to list. If you need help keeping track of those must-dos that you want to do, go ahead and scan the QR code you see on the screen now or head to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney plans. Then you can pick up your free DFB planning worksheets, which will help you organize and schedule your best Disney World trip ever. Another thing you'll want to consider before you go, breakfast. <laughs> Three days isn't a whole lot of time to explore the park, so you're not going to want to waste a whole lot of your park mornings grabbing a meal each day. Plan to pack breakfast goodies in your park bag, like granola bars, pop-tarts, protein shakes, etc., that you can easily eat on the go. And finally, let's talk about your arrival and departure date. Whether you're traveling to Disney via car or plane, you can really get the most out of your vacation by planning an early arrival and late departure time. Since three days doesn't give you a whole lot of wiggle room to do extra exploring, you can use those arrival and departure days to soak up other parts of Disney World that you wouldn't be able to experience otherwise, like the Disney Resorts or the Disney Springs Shopping District. If you're planning a Disney World vacation for 2025, you can really soak up that arrival day now with a trip to one of Disney's water parks. Yep, Disney World recently announced that in 2025, those staying at Disney resorts, including Disney Vacation Club properties, will get a free park ticket to enter the water parks on their arrival day. You'll be able to use this park at either Blizzard Beach or Typhoon Lagoon, but only on your check-in day. So if you've got that perk to use in the future, don't let it go to waste. All right, we got all the planning done. It is day one, Magic Kingdom, rise and shine. We're starting our three-day vacation in the OG Disney World Park 1971 Magic Kingdom. Okay, not really 1970. I mean, it opened in 1971. You get it. Okay, so this morning, your day is gonna start real early, like real, real early, cause you're gonna wanna get up around 6.50 a.m. to log into your My Disney Experience account and get ready to snag your spot in the Tron Light Cycle Run virtual queue once it opens at 7 a.m. There's a whole lot of virtual queue nuance that I could get into that I just don't have time to thoroughly explore in today's video, but I'm going to link our full post all about virtual queues down in the description, which is going to give you more of a play-by-play -play and a step-by-step -step for how these things work. Or you can always purchase an individual lightning lane for those rides instead to skip over all the virtual queue stress in the first place. Individual lightning lanes are available in Magic Kingdom for Tron and Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, but in a perfect scenario, I'm going to assume you did get into the Tron virtual queue, yay you, 
so you only have to worry about purchasing an individual lightning lane for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train if you want one, that is. Otherwise, I'd suggest making a beeline to this coaster first thing in the morning before the lines get wildly long for it. Now, if you purchase an ILL for Seven Dwarfs, aim to book a return time for later in the evening. It's always fun to ride this one when the sun goes down. The visuals are easier to see that way and the coaster feels faster too. And since we're talking about lightning lanes, this is a good time to mention that yes, you're probably gonna wanna purchase Genie Plus for your very busy Bee Magic Kingdom day, which is gonna give you lightning lane access for most of the rides here. Aside from Tron and Seven Dwarfs, since they're individual lightning lane and virtual queue only, as well as a few others that just don't have lightning lanes at all, like People Mover and Astro Orbiter, for instance. Now you can book your first Genie Plus Lightning Lane right at 7 a.m. on the day of your visit, and then you'll be able to make your next selection after 120 minutes have passed, starting when the park opens, or your return time window has ended, or you've used your Lightning Lane selection and are ready to book another. Again, a lot of nuance here, so be sure to study up on Genie Plus before you buy it. We've got lots of videos on it, I promise. So which Lightning Lanes should you prioritize in Magic Kingdom? Again, it really depends on what your family's after experience-wise, but Peter Pan's flight is typically a good one to start with. It's popular, it's cute, it's good for all ages, and the line can get really, really long. Even though the line is fun to wait in because there are little interactive elements to it, uh, still, time is money, y'all. All right, we've made it to midday. With Genie Plus in tow, you should be able to knock out many of the most popular Magic Kingdom rides throughout the morning and on into the afternoon. This includes stuff like Haunted Mansion, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Pirates of the Caribbean, assuming it's actually open, it's been down a lot lately, Jungle Cruise, and Space Mountain. It's important to have a portable charger on hand so you can juice up your phone on the go, since the My Disney Experience app is gonna be the MVP of your group that day. Though it might be hard for you to slow down once you've got your Magic Kingdom momentum going, don't forget to factor in some food. Since you've got all those lightning lane return times you're gonna need to plan around, plus you've got a Tron boarding group number that could be called at any time, you'll probably wanna stick with a quick service for lunch. Our personal favorite in Magic Kingdom is Columbia Harbor House in Liberty Square, which serves up big surf and turf meals at a decent price point. But depending on where you are in the park, you may also wanna look into going someplace else that's closer to you, like Cosmic Ray Starlight Cafe in Tomorrowland, Pecos Bill, Tall Tale Inn and Cafe in Frontierland, or Casey's Corner on Main Street, USA. Or you might even want to snack your way through lunch instead. Magic Kingdom's got a great variety of savory and sweet options you can munch on, and some of our go-to Magic Kingdom snacks are the cheeseburger spring rolls at the Adventureland Spring Roll Cart, the fresh fruit waffle sandwich at Sleepy Hollow Refreshments in Liberty Square, the creamy bacon mac and cheese tots at the Friars Nook in Fantasyland, and the tropical serenade or really any Dole Whip treats over at Aloha Isle in Adventureland. Now, eventually your boarding group number will be called for your Tron virtual queue, and it'll finally be time to ride the fastest coaster in the park. You'll have an hour window to get over to the Tron ride and scan in for your virtual queue, unless Disney gives you a two hour window, which they've done in the past during particularly busy days in the park. When you've hit a ride, slump or you're not using any lightning lanes and the ride lines are just getting way too long by the mid-afternoon, jump into some of those classic indoor animatronic shows that never have terribly long waits, or any waits really. This includes iconic attractions like Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, Carousel of Progress, and the Hall of Presidents. Not only are the wait times almost non-existent for these most of the time, but they'll also allow you to sit in the AC for a bit and rest your feet. So now that the sun is starting to set, let's find our second wind and finish out the Magic Kingdom day strong. Dinner is another meal you'll want to grab quickly at one of the park's fast food joints or snack your way through. A few other solid snacking options you might want to consider later on in the evening include the ham, provolone, and Swiss sandwich from Gaston's Tavern in Fantasyland, the candied bacon skewer at Westward Ho in Frontierland, or the Cheshire Cattail at Cheshire Cafe in Fantasyland. Warning, the Cheshire Cafe kiosks tend to close a couple hours before the park does, so keep your eye on the hours via the My Disney Experience app. If you really want a nice sit-down meal for dinner instead of something super quick, Magic Kingdom has a few impressively immersive dining room options for you to choose from, so you can always shift your schedule around to squeeze in a table service reservation into your evening, especially if you're okay with sacrificing a ride or two. For a family-style, all-you-can-eat option, you might want to book reservations for Liberty Tree Tavern in Liberty Square. 
For a unique menu inside an equally as unique Jungle Cruise-themed dining room, consider booking Skipper Canteen in Adventureland. And for a prefix meal inside the Cinderella Castle, make sure you grab those Cinderella's Royal Table Reservations ASAP because they do book up quickly. Now, did you forget about your individual lightning lane? Hopefully not, because it's finally time for you to backtrack to Fantasyland and ride Seven Dwarfs Mine Train without worrying about the 75 plus minute wait. You may notice that the crowds start to dwindle down for many of the attractions as the evening goes on, which could be a good time to hit up the ones you didn't grab lightning lanes for, like Under the Sea, Voyage of the Little Mermaid, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, or Fill Our Magic. Just make sure you're back on Main Street USA 30 to 45 minutes before the nighttime spectacular, Happily Ever After, starts up at Cinderella Castle. It can be tricky to find last-minute standing room to see Happily Ever After's screen projections and fireworks combo, which is why scouting out your spot early is going to come in handy. When the last firework is shot, this is your last moment to really appreciate being in Magic Kingdom before all the chaos begins, because once that show is over, everyone and their mother will be making their way out of the park, flooding into the trans transportation lines that'll get them back to their hotels. Now, depending on the hotel, you might want to save some money for a ride share. If you're staying at one of the monorail resorts like Polynesian Village, Grand Floridian Resort and Spa, or Contemporary, getting back to your room shouldn't be a huge problem. Worst comes to worst, you just walk over to your hotel room at that point. But getting out of Magic Kingdom otherwise can be a real pain in the you-know-where. Either you're going to have to deal with super long bus lines to get you back to your hotel, or you're going to have to deal with super long monorail rail and ferry boat lines to get back to your car or ride share. So just to savor your time in Magic Kingdom a little bit longer and to wait out those initial massive crowds, consider hanging back for an extra half hour to enjoy the Main Street USA shops that'll stay open for a little while after the park closes. You'll also get to witness the goodnight kiss from Cinderella Castle, which is Disney's not so subtle way of saying, we love you, but please leave. <laughs> now, want to get out of the park in a jiff? Your best chance of accomplishing that is by booking a minivan, which is Disney World's very own rideshare service operated by Lyft. While minivans will be pricier than standard rideshares, typically around $30 to $45 per ride, they'll pull up right to the Magic Kingdom bus stops and pick you up for a private and quick ride back to your Disney hotel. Just know, you might want to book this a little bit earlier, like right when the fireworks are happening, because things tend to get a little busy at that time of night. And I've been known to wait for a minivan for a long time. All right, it is day two. This is our double park day. And nope, we're not using a park hopper for this one, nor are we going to be using Genie Plus. So how are we still going to manage to accomplish two parks in one day? Well, by planning our trip's timeline very, very precisely. This is why you're here at DFB Guide. We know all the tricks, y'all. So in the morning, let's start day two over at possibly my favorite park ever, Disney's Animal Kingdom. Now, I know Epcot is my favorite park ever. That's kind of what's almost tattooed on me. I don't actually have an Epcot tattoo, but if I had a park tattoo, it would be an Epcot one. But Animal Kingdom is kind of that second in command for me where it's just so zen and chill. Anyway, Disney's Animal Kingdom, here we go. We're not gonna be using Genie Plus today. I'd still recommend purchasing an individual lightning lane for Animal Kingdom's most popular ride, Flight of Passage, though. You can purchase ILL starting at 7 a.m. if you're staying at a Disney Resort hotel. Otherwise, individual lightning lanes go live for the general public once the park officially opens. On an average day, Animal Kingdom tends to open earlier than all the other parks, but you can get into the park even earlier than the listed opening time by using your early theme park entry. Once again, this perk is going to be available to you if you're staying at a Disney-owned hotel. This is going to get you into any parks on any day 30 minutes before they open to the general public. So if you're using that early theme park entry and you've already got an individual lightning lane booked for Flight of Passage, I'd suggest hitting up Navi River Journey first thing in the morning since it'll be the second longest line you'll encounter in the park that day. Now, Animal Kingdom doesn't have a whole lot of rides, so once you're done with Navi, you can make your way over to the Africa section of the park and go ride Kilimanjaro Safaris. Or maybe you want to do that one before Navi if you really want to see that lion roar. After that, knocking out the next two biggest rides, Expedition Everest and Dinosaur, should be easy peasy, especially if you decide to use the single rider line for Expedition to save yourself even more time standing in line. On average, both of these rides tend to rack up 20 to 30 minute waits, so you can either squeeze them into your 
morning or wait to ride them once you've had some lunch. Now, midday, again, you've got a big day ahead of you, so you may be tempted to pick up a speedy lunch from one of the Animal Kingdom quick services, like Satuli Canteen in Pandora, or Flame Tree Barbecue in Discovery Island, or Yak and Yeti Local Foods Cafe in Asia. Don't forget to use the mobile order function on your My Disney Experience app so you can make things extra speedy for yourself. You may even want to place your mobile order in advance while you're killing time in line for one of the rides. The great thing about mobile orders is you get to choose your pickup time, and the restaurant will make it fresh once you arrive to come get it. With all that being said, you do have time today to fit in a nicer sit-down meal for lunch in Animal Kingdom if you want to slow down for a bit and just savor the moment, take a bit of a breather too after all those rides. So if you want to factor in a table service during your two-park day, you'll want to make advanced dining reservations for Yak and Yeti in Asia, Tusker House in Africa, or maybe even Tiffin's in Discovery Island if you're after something real fancy. And remember, reservations go live for sit-down restaurants starting 60 days before your visit. You might also want to consider putting your name on the walk-up waitlist for what's perhaps my favorite Disney lounge of all time, Nomad Lounge over in Discovery Island, attached to the Tiffin's restaurant. I actually do have a Nomad Lounge tattoo. No, I don't. That's not true, but I probably might someday. Anyway, you can start putting your name on the walk-up waitlist starting at 11 a.m. each day for Nomad, but you can't make an advanced dining reservation here. It's all first come, first served. Keep your eye on the time because you're going to need to head out of Animal Kingdom before it officially closes for the day around 5.30 or 6 p.m. And that means you need to make sure the things you fill your afternoon with post-lunch are your must-dos. While there's still a lot you could knock out in Animal Kingdom if given more time, I totally recommend prioritizing one of the stage show here. It's like Festival of the Lion King in Africa or Finding Nemo the Big Blue and Beyond in the area right before Dino Land USA. Both of these productions use live entertainers to sing, dance, put on an acrobatic performance, and use puppetry to bring our favorite Disney characters to life. Before you use your Flight of Passage Lightning Lane, treat yourself to a little midday snack, which you may really want to do if you didn't book a table service restaurant and you're now starting to feel a bit munchy. For a unique Animal Kingdom treat, I'd suggest swinging by Harambe Fruit Market in Africa for their corn on the cob with spices, Eight Spoon Cafe in Discovery Island for that pulled pork mac and cheese, Mr. Kamal's in Asia for their seasoned fries, RIP all the sauces, there's just one sauce now, or Pongu Pongu in Pandora for their Pongo Lumpia. And then, and then, and then, it is off to Flight of Passage with you. Let this be your big send off for the Animal Kingdom day before heading over to the next park. Now, where are we heading to exactly? We don't have a park hopper. Why, Hollywood Studios, of course, for their After Hours event. After Hours are separately ticketed events available at select parks on certain nights, and they allow you to experience the parks after they close to the general public for up to three hours. Anyone can buy a ticket to this, but they do have limited capacity. So you're gonna be able to ride the rides, meet the characters, and snack on the complimentary snacks, which are popcorn, ice cream bars, bottled sodas, without having to worry about massive lines or booking lightning lanes or snagging 7 a.m. virtual queues or even cooking in the sun. For Hollywood Studios, after hours are taking place on select nights in 2024 until August 29th. So if you're planning a summertime trip, this might be a good event to take advantage of. The downside of choosing after hours for Hollywood Studios instead of a regular park day ticket is that you're gonna miss out on those epic Broadway style shows that only run until the early evening, like Beauty and the Beast Live on Stage, Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, and Frozen Sing Along Celebration. So you'll have to decide if skipping out on those in exchange for shorter ride lines is gonna be worth it. However, you will still get the chance to see Hollywood Studios' nighttime spectacular, Fantasmic, since After Hours guests can enter the park for a pre-party mix-in as early as 7 p.m., even though the event itself doesn't kick off until 9.30. Now, once you arrive at Hollywood Studios and scan in your event ticket, don't worry about getting in line for the rides yet. You've got three hours to do that after all the other guests clear out. Instead, use this time to track down an on-the-go dinner that you can take with you into the Fantasmic Amphitheater, because yes, you are allowed to bring food and drink into the show, so multitask away. The most convenient spots to grab a quick bite to eat that are still near the Phantasmic Theater are those little kiosks you're gonna find in Sunset Ranch Market and Sunset Boulevard. Not my favorite place in the world, but doable in this circumstance. The only kiosks really worth hitting here are Fairfax Fair for their savory waffle bowls and Hollywood Scoops for their ice cream and seasonal shakes. Otherwise, you might want to venture out a little further and pick up food from one of the quick services with a little more variety, like ABC Commissary, Backlot Express, or Woody's Lunchbox. Now, once you got your food, go find your spot for Fantasmic. Enjoy the show, cry a little bit. After that, ride like the wind, bullseye. 
Despite the ride times being a whole lot shorter than they will be during the day, continue to keep an eye on those ride wait times via the My Disney Experience app. Sometimes queues can still be a bit lengthy when the event first kicks off since regular day guests will be getting their last ride throughs before heading out, but they should drop off pretty quickly after that. This event goes on until 12.30 a.m., so if you're there till the bitter end, prepare to not get back to your hotel room until maybe 1.30 to 2 a.m. Note, if you book a room at one of the Disney Skyliner hotels like Pop Century, Art of Animation, Caribbean Beach, or Riviera, the Skyliner does close 90 minutes after the parks do, so you'll need to depend on the Disney buses or your own mode of transportation to get you back to your resort. That is a long Disney day, folks, so don't underestimate it. Depending on your group and whether you have little ones or not, this strategy might not be the best plan of attack for you. Instead, you may want to stick with one park or the other, or you might want to stick with the park hopper option to accomplish multiple parks in a single day instead. Talk it over with your group and decide what the best course of action is here, because the last thing you want to be for the third day of your trip is completely wiped out. All right, it is your final day in Disney World, so what better way to cap off your trip than by traveling around the world? Yep, we are going to Epcot. So in the morning, if you got back to your hotel room late last night, you don't have to rope drop this park if you don't want to. But you still need to remember to either first purchase an individual lightning lane for Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind or get into the Cosmic Rewind virtual queue for free at 7 a.m. Now, I totally understand if you accidentally sleep through that 7 a.m. alarm if you were out at Hollywood Studios past midnight on day two. Honestly, you might not even set an alarm at all. I'd rather you get your beauty sleep than be sleep deprived during your final Disney day too. So if you're able to get into the Cosmic Rewind virtual queue at 7 a.m., then awesome. But if you don't, you will have a second chance to enter that line at 1 p.m. Just make sure you're inside Epcot once the 1 p.m. virtual queue goes live. Unlike the 7 a.m. drop, which you can enter into from the comfort of your hotel bed and then go right back to sleep if you desire, you must be inside the park for the 1 p.m. drop to be eligible for a boarding group number. So Epcot opens at 9 a.m. each day, but the majority of the World Showcase area doesn't open until 11. That being said, the most popular rides inside the World Showcase, like Remy's Ratatouille Adventure in France and Frozen Ever After in Norway, will still open when the rest of the park does. So if you can get in line for either of those, or both, depending on how early you arrive, before the rest of the showcase opens, you should be able to hit them up before they see their high wait times of the day. Now here's a word of caution for you. The middle of World Showcase, aka all those center pavilions without any rides, will be blocked off until 11 a.m. So you're gonna have to go the long way, wrapping all the way around the front entrance of the World Showcase area if you're trying to hit both Remy and Frozen Ever After first thing in the morning. Now, while you typically don't need Genie Plus for this park, you may still want it just to skip over the lines for these heavy hitter attractions, as well as other heavy hitters like Test Track and sometimes Soarin'. But honestly, if you hit up those popular rides right at the start of the day, or even wait to hit them up toward the end of the day when families are getting ready to watch the nighttime spectacular, then they shouldn't give you too much trouble usually. All wait time rules get thrown out the window during Disney World's busy, busy seasons, like around the holidays or during spring break. So you might want to save back for Genie Plus for all those park days just as a safety net option, since you only got three days. Now, a morning at Epcot is also a good time to check out the latest immersive walkthrough experience, Journey of Water, inspired by Moana. While this one is awesome to see once the sun goes down too, Journey of Water in the morning typically has fewer crowds. Plus, if your kids decide to get really drenched in this interactive play area, you can always rely on the Orlando sun to help everyone get dried off, which isn't a privilege you'll get at nightfall. At either rate, you may want to pack an extra pair of dry clothes in your park backpack just in case. Now, Epcot's got a lot of great table service restaurants you can make reservations for for lunch, but we're going to skip all those for now as we make our way around the World Showcase. The unique thing about Epcot is that it hosts four different festivals throughout the year. So if your trip falls during one of those festival time frames, you're not only going to be able to check out all the limited time entertainment going on, but you're also going to be able to munch and drink your way around dozens of different festival food booths. These are our favorite. Be sure to watch our Epcot Festival videos before you head out so you can get a good idea of what specific things are offered at each booth and which ones will actually be worth investing your time and money in. Now, on the first day of every festival, we go and we eat every single food item at every single booth. So we really have a good idea of what's worth your money and what's not. So we always do those festival videos, usually the day after the festival started, so you get to see exactly what our pros and cons and recommendations are. Now, side note, depending on how big your group is or who's in your party, don't be afraid to split up. Some folks enjoy taking Epcot real leisurely, like making 
sure to explore every nook and cranny that each of the 11 World Showcase pavilions has to offer, and that's awesome. And other people like to fill their afternoons with back-to-back -back rides that don't garner wait times like the more popular attractions do. This includes Spaceship Earth, Living with the Land, Grand Fiesta Tour, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, Mission Space, Journey into Imagination with Figment, and then there are some who like to do a little bit of both. In bigger travel groups, it's hard to keep everyone together and still make sure everyone gets to do everything they want. So don't feel guilty about branching out and reconvening later on if need be. Now, if you did jump into the Cosmic Rewind virtual queue line around 1 p.m., then your callback time for this ride will happen later on in the evening. Make sure you've turned on the My Disney Experience push notifications so that your phone can notify you once it's your turn to ride. While you're more than welcome to continue snacking your way around the festival booth throughout dinner time too, you may want to try one of Epcot's quick service options instead. Some of the most popular quick services in Epcot for families include Regal Eagle Smokehouse and the American Adventure Pavilion. I know I'm as surprised as you are that I'm recommending the American Adventure Pavilion for food because it's really never been on our radar until Regal Eagle opened. And this place is super, super good. You can also go to Sunshine Seasons in the Land Pavilion and Connections Cafe and Eatery in World Celebration. That one's really good for pickier eaters. Now, as the sun sets, make sure you backtrack to Spaceship Earth to ooh and ah over this beacon of magic. Every 15 minutes, yeah, no, they really call it the beacon of magic. That's, that's, I, I didn't make that up. No, every 15 minutes until the end of the night, Spaceship Earth is going to put on an LED light show once it gets dark. The show rotates between two to three different sets, so you might want to visit this area a few different times toward the end of the day to see those unique show variations. And for an even more unique angle of the light show, head over to the New World Celebration Gardens to watch one of these performances from behind Spaceship Earth. The pavement and light beams in this new area light up to go along with the show's colorful projections. And that always gives me major chills because I never thought we'd see the twinkling colorful Epcot sidewalks again after they were originally taken away from us to make way for all that Epcot construction. So my actual perfect night in Epcot would be pretty boring for some folks because I think I would just stay here and soak in the nostalgia of it all, remembering what this park used to be when I was a kid and why I wanted to start my DFB website in the first place. Before you find a spot for Epcot's nighttime fireworks display, Luminous, which takes place on the World Showcase Lagoon, go find yourself something to snack on during the show. If you're looking for some of the best snacks this park has to offer, you're going to want to try any of the caramel options over at Caramel Kusha in the Germany Pavilion, a pastry from Kringle Bakery Og Cafe in the Norway Pavilion, one of the French bakery items from Léal Boulangerie Patisserie in the France Pavilion, or maybe even a cocktail or spirit from the Rose and Crown Pub from the UK. A tasty snack and fireworks? The night does not get much better than that. Now after the show, it'll be time to wrap up the day as well as your trip. However, if you're staying at one of the Disney Deluxe Resorts, you might have one last opportunity to hang around the park for an hour or two longer. On select evenings at certain parks, Deluxe Resort guests can use their extended evening hours benefit to hang out for a couple extra hours after the park closes to the general public. So instead of paying for an entire after hours ticket, your hotel might give you more hours in the park regardless. So be sure to check on the hours and events calendar via the Disney website to see when the extended evening hours will be available during your trip if you're staying at a deluxe resort. Now, when it comes to a three-day Disney getaway, be sure to set your expectations. Unfortunately, three days isn't enough time to do everything in Disney World, but you can sure do a whole lot of things with the time you're given. Use those free planning worksheets we talked about earlier, which you can find over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash DisneyPlans to figure out your ride must-dos and decide what parks you want to prioritize and create an itinerary that's going to make your family go, yeah, now this trip is going to be epic. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching and thanks for spending three days in Disney World with us. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.